Hi, I'm Alicia. Um, I work for a mainstream news organization too, and I'm really uh, curious. You talk about objectivity, and I, you know, and, and that being a concern, and obviously discussing um, that when you when you're making a decision in terms of covering religion. But I'm, I'm curious how you determine and how you distinguish, particularly in this age of news where POV is so forthcoming. Um, in your face and seen as you know the, the right thing to do or the way to go. Um, where, where does objectivity end and insight begin? Because oftentimes, to your point, that can be helpful in even, like you say, you don't know what you don't know if, you, if you're not a part of that group to even know that that's something newsworthy to take note of, let's say, the way someone talks. So I'm curious how you balance um, the two of those, and even in just who you assign to a story, where that can be useful. So your question is, where does objectivity and, and sort of insight sort of begin? And I'm just curious the process branding, in terms of how you're making those determinations of, of when it's, that insight is useful versus when it might be a bias. Right. What are the kind of questions, you know, as editors, you all are asking, and maybe that's still a process being determined, and... Yeah. Um, I mean, the, I mean, obviously we do wrestle with these kind of things. Uh, they're, they're, I mean, it's interesting, there was a, um, back in the day, uh, if you had ever worked on a political campaign, for example, um, that would be a big no-no in terms of hiring you. Uh, or it'd be uh, at least a, que a major question. And somebody had actually, you know, a lot of times I get questions from younger people at wondering, you know, should I do this or what's the career path or whatever. And some, some people have asked, you know, if I worked on a political campaign, is that going to hurt, um, you know, my ability to get into journalism? And interestingly, so I guess that's a statement about, yeah, so interestingly, I think it matters a lot less now. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's a statement of sort of where we are, I guess, um, where it's much more common these days uh, for people to sort of go back and forth. There's less of a, um, of a sort of a, a dividing line. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess like, uh, I mean, as an editor, so, so if, I, if I had signed a reporter to something and I knew that they had some sort of background that, I don't know, I mean, uh, what's a good example of this? Okay, so I'm, I'm Asian American. So I'm going to send you know another Asian American reporter to cover I don't know I don't know I'll just randomly make up an example like there were race riots in Los Angeles or something like that and you want to send another Korean reporter or something like that uh, at, to the Korea town or something like that so you would probably want to send that reporter because they speak Korean maybe or they they you know the fact that they you know are Asian will probably help them sort of a little bit in bridging sort of divides. Uh, but then obviously you got to be sort of worried about, you know, are there going to be biases or whatever. But again, I guess like I feel like we can rely upon the sort of uh, um, uh, um, the apparatus, the infrastructure of, of newspapers, which I think is actually a big difference between, you know, if you go to like a, a website like a BuzzFeed or like a Politico or something like that, um, while they do have, you know, strong standards, and I respect Politico and BuzzFeed and all these sort of websites out there, they have much less by way of editing and copy editing and sort of layers. And so when you're at the New York Times, there's, there's so much of an infrastructure of, okay, so there's going to be an editor who edits the, co the, the you know, the ba they call it a backfielder who sort of edit, do the first edit. There's going to be a copy editor that gets passed to, there's going to be a slot copy editor who sort of is back reading on that, there's going to be other sort of bigger editors who are sort of also back reading. And I think like the, the, the belief is that, you know, those layers should be able to sort of catch, you know, those issues. Do we, do we, do we not, do we screw up sometimes? Yeah, because a lot of times this stuff is on deadline, it's happening very fast and, um, but I think that's actually one thing that you know newspapers like the New York Times still continue to bring is that we have these sort of layers. We have a giant copy desk. You know, we have we haven't you know like a lot of these websites with these with the emphasis on speed, there is no copy error. There might be a, a light line at it, you know, and then they'll put it up. Um, and so there's a lot more sort of room for uh, um, sort of mistakes, I think. And I guess I would just sort of hope that. 
Um, you know, obviously we, we would have to make, uh, it's hard to sort of, for me to sort of talk about it without sort of knowing that, like a very specific situation and how I would handle it. But I guess in general I would err on the side of like, if I think somebody could bring something to something that could help them report the story, uh, you know, I would, want, I would want them to bring whatever that they could bring. You know, and then in terms of the sort of fear from bias, yeah, there are times we might excuse a reporter from covering something. Um, you know, uh, if it involves a family member or like, you know, something like that, like, I don't know. There are plenty of circumstances where we would do it. But I guess I, I think in general, we would generally trust the professionalism of the, of, the, of the reporter and trust that the sort of apparatus of the New York Times would catch it. I think that's the answer. I'm sort of curious, is there any subject, Mike, that you would want to recuse yourself from covering if you were assigned that right. you feel or? Well, I mean, I, I wrote that story about uh, Redeemer and Tim Keller, um, but I wasn't uh, a member of Redeemer. I didn't go to Redeemer at, uh, um, at that point, and I wouldn't have done the story, you know, if mm -hmm. I was. Um, so that would be an example where it's sort of too close. Mm -hmm. um, and I think others would probably say the same thing. Um, I mean, again, it's case by case, um, so it's hard to sort of draw like a complete, uh, you know, say only only this circumstance or that circumstance. Mm -hmm. All right. a question over here. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I was wondering, maybe you don't want to say, but what is the worst mistake in your perspective that you think you've made, and how did you recover from it? Oh, I've made. Yeah. <laughs> or that you've been responsible for. <laughs> So we can learn from you. <laughs> uh, well, I haven't made any career-ending ones yet. Um, I don't know, because I mean, I'm thinking about like, uh, you know, if you. There have been like good journalists who have made like you know really serious like. I, I, an example that comes to mind. I, I don't remember the exact circumstances. This was not me, but like somebody came. We wrote a whole story about somebody. I think who was supposed to be somebody who uh, um, was recovering from or a refugee from like Katrina or or, or or something like that. And we wrote this whole really sad story about it. And it turned out the person had completely misled us and yeah. the reporter and and um, and it was a complete fiction. Um, but that reporter is still at the New York Times, and like, and and obviously there were sort of consequences, repercussions. A lot of it might not have been, you know, there are certain things that we could have done, perhaps, to sort of push to to double check. But anyways, I'm trying to think of like a. Well, here's maybe a follow-up that might help jog a little bit. We had a midterm exam in Intro to Journalism this week, and I'm not going to name names of students, but there were a few uh, on the story they had to write, which was a, a redo of a Pulitzer Prize story of 1961, Death at the Opera. Uh, so in the story they wrote, there were a few names misspelled. And I was trying to impress this week, right. what happens inside a newspaper when right. even something like a right. name is misspelled? And can you give us a picture inside the New York yeah. Times? Um, what? Uh, uh, what a correction, when a correction happens, what happens to you? And the, the, well, that's the definitely process. part of the, uh, you know, especially after the Jason Blair thing, there would became like a big sort of, it became a much, much bigger focus on corrections um, and you know making sure we corrected things. and. And uh, having a culture, uh, sort of re-emphasizing that we need to have a cu culture of uh, being openness, but and also, um, but it was much more that if corrections, you have a lot of corrections, um, that's going to reflect on your evaluation, and you know it's going to reflect on sort of you know whether you could even stay at the New York Times. I think um, you know there have been some reporters who have been had issues with a lot of corrections, and that's definitely. Uh, um, you know, big no-no, and um, it's definitely something that when you commit, when you screw something up, like spell somebody's name wrong, you know, I think I once, like, you know, I don't know, this is not a big, I, I once thought it's called, like, a con I said in a story, a, a member of Congress, I said he was a Democrat when he was a Republican. So, like, you know, I was on deadline, and um, really, really embarrassing. Um, so, uh, I don't know, you could just, you could do a nexus search of Michael Luo and correction or something, <laughs> and you'll see all my corrections. <laughs> Fortunately, I, like, as an investigative reporter, I don't write stories as often, and I'm an editor, and I don't write, so, like, you know, you won't find many recently, so. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, there are definitely been times I've sweated it, 
Yeah. You know, like I, you'll get on this bad run, you know, and like, um, you know, certain people are better with attention to detail and than others, and I think I'm not as good at attention to detail. I'm not like super, you know, meticulous and, 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 and I've screwed things up, um, like things like age and, and, and misspelling somebody's name and like, and uh, we, but we obsess about it. And you know, I'm a good example is, uh, you know, the New York Times takes really seriously being the paper of record and like, uh, there was a, uh, you know that, um, the, 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 the movie 12 Years a Slave, um, yeah. um, so it came, like, so somebody, it came out like when, you know, won the, won the best picture, somebody sort of, the, the, the article that, uh, in the New York Times about, uh, I forget the guy's name, Solomon Winthrop or something, I forget his name. Like he came, came up, uh, came up and it was sort of circulating. This was the sort of story in the New York Times about, you know, this man who was, uh, was, uh, was became, was forced to become a slave. And it turned out we had misspelled his name. And so uh, we, we, we corrected it 150 years later. And I, I can only imagine on the investigative team at the Times that the NRA or other groups or anybody on the wrong side of your story is going to be going through with a fine-tooth comb, right. not only looking for name misspellings, but anything that they could uh, yeah. perceive as something wrong, that they could get a correction, because that is a victory. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, I mean, actually, I mean, you saw that happen with the, with the, that story that happened recently with Christie and... Uh, you know the bridge, and we had a, we put up a very fast story um, about um, there was just sort of a slight nuance that we we kind of got wrong in the lead, and the Christie can the Christie and, you know people jumped on it, and you know in this sort of day and age of war rooms, um, um, rapid response, uh, they had a lot of ammunition to sort of fight back, and it sort of you know, stepped on sort of the bigger picture, you know, which was, you know, that he had some contradictions in his story. But, um, so that's a good example of how correction can, you know, can really hurt. Yeah. So. More questions, we've got a few minutes left. Carly? Thank you for joining us. Um, my question is just, do you think that the secular reputation of the New York Times has caused maybe younger Christians who are graduates of journalism um, kind of caused them to shy away from applying Sorry. to the New York Times or aspiring to that. I mean, it has a great reputation in the secular community, but do you see that as harmful? Uh, um, I don't know. It's I, I don't. Um, it's possible, I guess. Um, um, I, I mean, I think the reason, I mean, in terms of why is there, I mean, there, there, this is a, goes back to the very complicated reason of like, okay, so why is there not more Christians at the New York Times? Well, you know, like I said, I, I, I said in, in the talk, you know, it's like a lot of other sort of elite sort of institutions filled with a lot of people from elite colleges and, you know, come from, you know, very cosmopolitan sort of, thing, you know, there's a sort of certain type, I guess. Um, um, and so those places, you know, go to Harvard, you go to like, you know, the New York Times, you go to Goldman Sachs, like, you know, you know, Christians are not sort of the, you know, majority or whatever. And so it's sort of, that's just, just that general sort of thing. Um, it's also very incredibly hard to be hired at the New York Times, um, especially recently, um, in the last couple of years. Uh, you know, we just generally in the past have had this sort of, you come in, young reporters come in on the Metro desk, you sort of pay your dues, go through your paces, learn how to be a reporter, and then you go on and be a national correspondent, foreign correspondent, in Washington, whatever. And that, lately, you know, in the last couple of years, as the recession has really shrunk, uh, you know, hurt, hurt hiring, and uh, we've sort of fallen down on the hiring younger people thing, um, and we've basically hired superstars. Um, so we hire, like, Anthony Shadid from the Washington Post. Um, we hire, you know, like some like big uh, political reporter or something, you know, or like we, you know, so, so then you're dealing with, okay, who are those people you're hiring? And I guess it's the same situation. You're hiring from big institutions like the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and they probably have the same sort of issue. Um, I don't know. I mean, so is the reason that there aren't more 
I don't even really know if you're, I mean, so it was part of the, 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 the I don't really know this from an HR perspective. It's, it's probably illegal to ask, like, are you a Christian <laughs> hiring or whatever. So, um, um, that, I mean, that, that, that whole issue of, like, you know, trying to uh, hire for a broad cross-section of America is something I think the Times is, you know, continually sort of struggling with. And the challenge is even greater in this era where we don't hire very often. And so, um, um, can you see that shift taking place? Where more Christians are coming? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, well, I guess it's hard to imagine. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it's hard to imagine, mainly because, well, I mean, you're, you got to, then, then you're talking about like producing a lot more. I don't know. I don't even really know the numbers of Christian young Christians journalists, young Christian journalists. I don't think it's probably that high. Um, so then you're talking about a pretty small pool of people trying to get them in to the New York Times. It's a it's a um, pretty tough road. I remember one time I tried to get Paul hired. So <laughs> yeah, I remember. I just got a promotion. I, I probably should have listened more. But I just got a promotion. I didn't. I didn't jump at the opportunity. Uh, I think you know. One, on that strain, and I'm going to go to Terry Manning with a question. On that strain, too, the best way to get to the New York Times is, is how Mike did, by just being a, a good Christian, a good journalist, and doing great stories. And then if, if uh, God sees fit and your career sees fit, that's where you end up. That's just maybe one synthesizing remark there. Uh, Terry. Yeah, I don't think it has helped that very few Christian colleges have taken journalism seriously right. for decade after decade. When I first started looking into that in the early 90s, I think I found five people on faculty of major Christian schools who had ever published a lead right. in a mainstream newspaper. Right. And so to some degree, the fault's on us right. as well. Right. Well, you're probably not going to be surprised to know I wanted to ask about the Bill Keller quote. The, uh, I realized that Bill Keller was not editor of the New York Times when he made his famous statement in Austin. He'd been out of office, so to speak, for three days. And he was asked, does the New York Times slant the news to the left? Mm. And he said, other than mm. on issues of culture and social issues. And he cited in particular gay rights, evolution, and a couple of other things related to religion. Mm -hmm. He said, other than moral and cultural issues, I don't think we slant the news. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that the exact quote, but and when, when was when was this? Was this, this was like three days after he left office? LBJ Library. The video is still online if you want to see it. Okay. Okay. So what's I thought it was the most important statement that's been made in American journalism in quite a while, because <laughs> basically what he essentially said was we try to get our political coverage fair, mm -hmm. but on moral and social issues and religious issues, we don't try. We don't try anymore. Uh, I don't think that's true. Um, um, but there is a greater danger in those issues, um, and um, you know, like uh, um, again, because of the sort of uh, you don't know what you don't sort of really know, and then this whole issue of sort of world views, and so um, I'm just thinking carefully here. I didn't want you to have to answer this yeah. one on the record. Right. <laughs> um, so, you know, when, 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 uh, okay, so keeping in mind also that uh, uh, with the caveat that not all, that, like I said, I've said this several times in the talk, evangelical, the, the thing, my, one of my biggest peeves is that, pet peeves is that evangelical is a theological orientation, it's not a political one. Right. So evangelicals are across the spectrum on, the, on these issues, um, including gay marriage, including, um, you know, a lot of this sort of, you know, hot button sort of issues. Um, um, uh, so when, uh, when, when New York approved gay marriage, um, I think that I remember, uh, you know, on Twitter, I, I actually think tweeted something about like journalists need to be careful at this moment um, because you know there was sort of, and I'm not saying necessarily specifically at the New York Times. I'm talking about like I'm on Twitter and I, you know, I follow a ton of people 
most of them journalists, and there was sort of a, I was seeing people celebrating, yeah. um, and um, I think at one point I, um, I talked to somebody about it sort of offline, and, um, and uh, his reaction was, at first he actually didn't know why I was cautioning him. Um, and, um, and so then I, I said, well, you know, obviously we're, we're you know, we're, so, you know, we don't, we don't tell people who we vote for. We don't, you know, we don't tell, uh, um, you know, what political party we belong to. Um, and same goes to like where we stand on this issue. And, and he sort of, and he sort of realized, oh yeah, you're, you're right. You know, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I have to be careful. Um, so. I guess that's a little bit indicative because I think there was a sort of a little bit of a feeling of they didn't fully realize that they were doing something potentially wrong. And so then that, that comes from sort of a blinder on that issue of like, okay, the issue is only really seen one way. Um, and so, so, so I think there probably there could be a potential for a lot of people, um, other people in the newsroom to Again, because if they're not exposed to people with other sort of viewpoints, uh, uh, um, um, they just don't really know that, that there is another side, I guess. Um, and so you're right, uh, you're right that it is an area that is probably the most dangerous and sort of uh, the one that we have to be the most careful about. But I would not say that we have given up on trying on it because, again, you know, we agonize uh, including on, on these sort of like, you know, sensitive issues about uh, getting it right. And, you know, I've been in the room where, where with, with, uh, with editors where they're sort of agonizing over phrases and, and, and um, um, you know, are we doing this fairly? And I, and I think the same would apply on that issue. Um, that's what I would say. This gets into, hopefully the students are thinking of the media theory classes. Right, and does the newspaper I mean, reflect the news? Does it right. give you what you want or what you need? Is it supposed to mirror? It can't be a mirror <clears throat> to everybody. Yeah. And I just want to, to say uh, thanks to Mike for standing up and exp I didn't know some of the stuff that you do behind the scenes there, but as a loyal New York Times reader, I wanted to start keeping a box now as a faculty member that when I see a story about a Christian person or institution that I think has done well, I want to save that because I think sometimes we often curse uh, when the mirror doesn't reflect what we want. But maybe we don't save a story like on David Wise, the young skier who won a gold medal and is a devoted Christian. And there was a wonderful profile of him in the Times Sports section about um, his, him and his faith. Um, I got time for, I think, one more question here from Jan. I think uh, Jan had his hand up first. Okay. And well, I've asked a question already, yeah. so oh, maybe okay. someone has some There's a couple student questions. Uh, it's up to you if this you want to yield a, to This the, was a follow-up. Uh, okay, let's go to Jan, and the students will, Mike will have a little bit of time to chat, too, uh, when we're finished here, okay? Just following up. Um, Please don't follow up. <laughs> <laughs> in a different way. Um, <laughs> I think you it's don't have to answer, Mike. Right. I think it's Be understood the that at the Wall Street Journal, there's a um, clear line between the news side and the editorial side of the paper. How strong is that line? How much is it emphasized at the New York oh. Times? I, I guess I'm surprised that you would say at the Wall Street Journal there's a clear line. And, well, and at least I well, say, say so. so. Well, I mean, I, I mean, it's a humongous the dividing line at the New York Times. I mean, there, and, and that, actually, that's kind of shocking that like some people don't know that, like the editorial board, like, and, and you see those unsigned editorials on the editorial page. That's written by the editorial board of the New York Times, which is a completely different entity from the newsroom. Uh, they're on a different floor. Like we don't interact with them. We don't know what they're writing about. Um, and uh, there is a you know a very sort of it's, it, it, you know it's like the separation of you know church and state. Like there there it's like the, there's a very sort of high bar. Um, and and it actually you know, this is where I think that sometimes we don't do a good enough job explaining ourselves in sort of this era of you know where there's a lot of sort of skepticism in the media. I, I was actually talking to a friend of mine from Harvard. Highly educated guy, you know, really successful venture capital guy, and he actually he messaged me. He's like, and he didn't and he didn't know that. He thought that like the reporters wrote the editorials, and um, 
and he had wondered about at one point, and he didn't know like really basic things. Like he's like, he's like, why is Nick Kristoff, you know, cheering about Obama? Isn't he like? So you're telling me he's a, you know, like there's you know they're not supposed to have opinions and report. I was like, Nick Kristoff is an op-ed columnist. <laughs> he's supposed to have opinions, you know, and, and and he didn't really sort of understand that there was a difference. Um, so there's a lot of sort of basic. Uh, you know, things that, you know, I guess I'm surprised that a lot of people don't know, but maybe we should do a better job explaining. So. Yeah, it's maybe a society issue. Uh, and I can see, by the way, for the Wall Street Journal, uh, when we were at Li uh, Liberty Street, 200 Liberty Street near here, we, the editorial page was, had its own glass office, different entry keys, and if you had a friend on the page, if you were a reporter and you had a friend on the editorial page, it was because something, you met them on the elevator, strangely, or something. but. Uh, when Rupert Murdoch bought the company, we moved to Midtown to his building. The editorial page was among all the journalists, by the way, and there was no wall anymore. Just fact. Symbolic. Uh, yeah. But I think there's a different issue. We're talking physical space. There's a different issue of bleeding into the pages or whatnot. But we can continue that maybe in our next off-record discussion. Um, I want to respect the students here organizing the refuge meeting. So I think we need to end now. But those are the two or three of you guys who have questions. Please come up and ask Mike, okay? Thanks. Let's, um, let's thank Mike.